Hey, I'm Paul Monnan and I run the Immortal Awards here at Little Black Book. Welcome to our first ever Most Immortal Ad panel. In the run up to each year's Immortal Awards, we ask all of our judges to pick an ad that they believe deserves the title of Immortal. What makes an Immortal Ad is ultimately up for them to decide, but we're looking for ads that have continued to live with them long after their launch. They are remembered, cherished and celebrated for years, if not decades after their release. Today, I am joined by Jose Miguel Sokolov, the Chief Creative Officer of Mullen Low UK, Global President of Mullen Low Group Creative Council, and Immortal Awards 2020 juror. And we're also joined by Walt Campbell, one of the most awarded advertising creatives of the last 50 years, and also a former Immortal Awards juror. Um, hello, guys, welcome. Um, we are here because, Jose, you picked Guinness's Surfer um, and Walt, you created Guinness Surfer. Um, and we'll start off with a nice, easy one for you, Jose. And that is, of all the ads in the world, why did you pick this as your most important? So, um, first, uh, it's, it's, it's as, as I've always said, it's an honor to be here, to be here and, and humbling me. Uh, and somebody who did something that I admire so much. When I when I first got asked to do the the to do the immortal was my immortal ad. I I did not do my homework properly. What other people had already chosen because my first choice would have definitely been uh, surfers, and uh, and they had chosen it. And I kind of worried about it because it's so great and so iconic and so important that I think people just shy away from choosing it because they think it's a little bit obvious and we all want to look interesting in our choices and i decided to go for the one ad uh the one piece of film that uh made me realize that advertising or that the business that i had decided to to join was much more could offer immense possibilities of, of real creative freedom and of real creative um, exploration. The fact that you chose the music that you chose, the fact that you chose, that you picked the casting that you, that, that you did, uh, the way it was written, the, the fact that it was so poetically written, and then the visual effects, I, I just, it just kind of transformed my view of, of what, great advertising was about and it was much more than 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 just storytelling or much more than just selling it was about inspiring and about and about touching uh, or, or or affecting parts of of the human emotion or the human process of being human that that are very hard to reach and to be able to do that in a minute um is is something that uh, that completely blew me away. And I had the good fortune of then um, seeing it in Cannes uh, in a gigantic screen, uh, almost in, in, in movie format. And then uh, I, I absolutely completely hated you, Walter, uh, because uh, it, 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 it became so much bigger and so much more powerful. And, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's, why, that's, that's why it is. It, it was transformational for me. Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's, um, it's wonderful, wonderful of you to say all those things. I would say it's, you know, especially coming from someone like you who, you know, the work that you've made and someone who really feels and understands the emotional impact of work in the way that you do, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to know what to say. It's appreciated, you know, and, um, you know, I, th I think, I think it's, it's, it's that thing, isn't it? You know, it's, it's um, often, you know, uh, when you get a chance to make something like that, it's really, you know, just about doing what everybody would do, which is that is just making the most of the opportunity. Yeah? And I think, you know, you, you've done that many times in the work that, uh, that you guys produce. And, 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 and I think that's really, you know, I think that's really, you know, at the heart of it, it's, it's really, uh, you know, about uh, so, sort of, you know the things. Everything you've talked about is just trying to get the most out of every every bit every bit of those elements, you know. And um, 
you know, in 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 uh, in that occasion, you know, we met, we managed to get most of it. You know, there's still things when I look at it that I think, oh, you know, we missed, you know, we missed that little bit, which is I'm sure everybody does that when they're looking at the work, you know. So, but thank you very much, and uh, especially appreciate it coming from you. In obviously, we're looking at this in retrospect and have a wonderful going review today, and. It's often cited as one of the best ads ever made. Did you know at the time when it launched that it was going to be, you're onto something special here? I mean, it's it, 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 it's absolutely, you know, you sort of get excited about ideas. You know, uh, I'm sure uh, everybody, you know, they sort of s will see, you know, something, you know, start to form and they'll feel, you know, we've got to really sort of get them, you know, this is this is a chance to make something different. You know, there'll be, there'll be you know, an image or there'll be a, 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 a thought or, you know, a, 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 a moment where you think, okay, you know, uh, let's not spill a drop of this energy, you know. So absolutely that was felt, you know, I think, um, I think there was a lot, a lot, lots of sort of other sort of attendant factors in this as well, you know, of, of expectation built around, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, it was it was the year David Abbott actually retired from AMV. And there was a lot of conversation. I mean, I, I had conversations with people like Peter Souter, who was running running the creative department at the time, and and uh, and Peter Mead, you know, about, you know, well, how are things going to be next year when Abbott's not around? And really, you know, there was a kind of sense of, you know, we've got to show him that we're carrying the torch, you know, that we're sort of keeping, you know, the standards as he would expect, expect them to be kept, you know. So that energy was going into it as well. But definitely, definitely uh, in the context of the work that we'd just done for them, we had a, we had a very successful ad. The first ad that we made for them was uh, Swim Black, and it did, it did really well, you know, it did well in awards. It was, it was, uh, it was the first time, you know, I worked, you know, properly. You know, I, I sort of had conversations and little interventions with Jonathan Glazer, but it was the first real project that we worked on, and he was amazing on that. And then, um, you know, moving into moving into this, uh, we uh, we sort of had sort of created this almost like symbiotic energy, you know, sort of he was tuning into sort of the things that I liked, and I was tuning into the things that you know, that sort of got him sort of, you know, excited. So it was kind of one of those things where it can't, it can't, things aligned, you know, a lot as well. You know, there's a lot of energy flowing in the, in the, in the right direction. And, you know, we, we really, you know, left no stone on turn. And, and, you know, right, you know, right through the agency, you know, like key to getting this film made was Yvonne Chopley, who sort of did, she was our producer. She did a mammoth amount of work in terms of like uh, weather investigation to find the best person in the world to predict the biggest waves that were going to happen, you know, sort of in our window of opportunity. And that was the thing, you know, that sort of Jonathan and I identified very quickly is the only thing that we couldn't really manipulate, that the technology wasn't there to manipulate properly was the size of the waves. So we needed to get really big waves, you know. So uh, through Yvonne's, you know, diligent work and sort of, you know, uh, extensive uh, research, uh, we arrived uh, in Kauai and the first day of shooting we got like 30 foot waves in it. Like within, I think, I think, I think turning over first day we sort of getting 30 foot waves almost immediately. So it was, it was, that was a big relief. And, you know, there was an element of, uh, there was an element of risk still in it, you know, because that, that was the best prediction we could get. And, you know, the, the, guy, the guy that Yvonne found was saying, you know, there will be big waves. I don't know if they'll be big every day, but they will be. You will get big waves. You know, so to get the waves and then to sort of know that the rest of the stuff we sort of knew how to do that—that that was uh, that was a massive uh, wind in our sails. You know? So yeah, we knew it was we knew it was going to be we knew it was going to be uh, had the potential to be bigger. On on paper, it's such an eclectic mix of elements, but black and white, VFX heavy surf film, like you say, huge wave shot in Hawaii, I believe. You've already mentioned the, the thumping soundtrack, the poetic voiceover. How do you sell that in to the client? How did you get them to go for this 
Well, I have to say, we had an amazing client. You know, it was a guy called Andy Fennell, and he, he actually bought the line, you know, where good things come to those that wait. So, uh, sort of, for the pitch, what happened was, you know, I, 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 sort, of, I sort of wrote a little, uh, I, I wrote quite a few ads, you know, different stories, but uh, almost as, as uh, just to show that it could, you know, translate into posters, I, I put some images as well with the line on it. And one of the images was a Polynesian surfer looking out to sea. It was a beautiful photograph. And um, I just put the line on it. But um, Andy Fennell uh, mentioned to someone at some point in the in the pitch, I think when he was leaving, he sort of pointed to this picture and he said, you know, um, oh, I would like to do something with surfers at some point because we've just started working with some surfers down in Cornwall. So this then was reported back to me, and um, I didn't know I didn't know there were surfers surfing down in Cornwall. And this is before this is before surfing really went mad. You know, when you sort of see surfing, it was kind of like you know, kind of a a bit more of a rarity. I'd seen some surfers in Ireland, you know, sort of like a little bit, but I hadn't really seen any in in, in England. And um, so I went down to Cornwall. I found these guys surfing and started talking to them about what it was. You know, the uh, their, their draw to this. And, and what was interesting was, you know, they very quickly would tell, you know, I had this notion that it was a sunshine sort of thing and there was a certain amount of drama to it, but these guys were sort of talking, you know, actually, if you get really big waves, you're risking your life. I thought, wow, that's amazing. So the energy levels, the sort of the, the fact that this was like a, a, a thing that was to do with, you know, there is this one wave out there. And they, they talked about this, you know, everybody has this notion that, you know, you're going to get this, ultimate wave, you know, so that very quickly dovetailed with the area of, you know, waiting and, 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 and it sort of echoed the, the little image that uh, Adi had seen, but it also energized it much more, you know, there was this much more, um, much more sort of daring, you, you know, thing that and size of energy and, you know, once you have those energies to play with, it becomes big and then I just started, I just started like working out like what, what, what would this wave, and what would this wave sort of be, you know, how would it come about? And I, you know, I looked at everything from like sort of the planets aligning to, I had this weird idea of um, whales, schools of whales pushing the sea, pushing the ocean along, and sort of creating this big wake, you know, ahead of them, pushing, pushing the thing to create this wave. And looking at all, and then from that, I sort of started playing with ideas of, uh, Neptune, I sort of think, is Neptune conducting this in the ocean in some way, or you know, was he riding the wheel? So the idea of Neptune and, and all of that sort of came came from that. So it was a big, it was a big sort of um, you know build from the client that actually, you know, as I was as I was working on it, I, I was sort of feeding this into the accounting, and so he was sort of aware. Oh yeah, you know, they're actually working on that. So we made the first film swim back, and at that. We uh, we showed him uh, we showed him and I think he was already sort of in the mood to say yes you know and the the that sort of that sort of coupled with the success of Swim Black Swim Black sold a lot of Guinness it it, it uh, I think I think they sort of had a, 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 a I think it was like an 11 12 percent uh, rise in sales in what they felt was a saturated market uh, that was also good you know it, you know the Swimmer was tall a lot of awards. But it sort of really sort of put the into into surfing. And we, yeah, we sort of we had a feeling it could be good. That's, that's the most lovely feeling when you finish something and you, you get you get the you, you get the, the notion that yeah we did something really special here. I, I you were talking I was really drawn to that about the wave and about you going down to Cornwall and talking to the. To the circles, because there is an element and there is a universalism about this thing of waiting for the perfect whale that the white wave, which also influenced me a lot in, in, in terms of story, does not have to be universal. It can be very specific. It's based on universal notions that everybody that the perfect wave is not there all the time. That that to me is is, is also a magical thing about this. Yeah. That's a very good point. There's a synergy, almost like, you know, it's sort of, it's almost like a little portrait of itself. You know, a lot of the things that were sort of like a, the atmospheres and, you know, you know, even 
even sort of to working with Jonathan, you know, you know, I've been working with uh, Tony K quite a bit up and then Tony K sort of uh, got his first like feature. And so, you know, I replaced Tony K. Jonathan wanted to be, which is a great thing. You know, he was, he was great. And also just sort of, you know, that, that sense of, you know, kind of um, things, you know, you know what it's like when you know, when you're around, you know, they understand, yeah, there's a reason to, you know, it makes that moment. But, you know, and, and, and Jonathan, you know, uh, very quickly sort of, you know, was tuning in and he loved working with, you know, sort of like with Kraft, you know, uh, I would always work with Johnny Byrne at Wave and Peter Rayburn on sound, you know, and, you know, very quickly, Jonathan became like one of us, you know, he sort of like fitted into that team because he was, he was asking the same questions as we were, you know, and he was, he was digging down that same greedy sort of uh, tunnel for more quality, you know, so, yeah, no, it was... Uh, Absolutely, it had that energy in it. Where did you get the soundtrack from as well? I think I've, I've spoken the to you. soundtrack, I mean, that was, that was uh, a, a, a very interesting process. I listened to over 2,000 tracks, sort of trying to find the soundtrack for that. And I'd find uh, on a film, I'd find a, a very beautiful track, but I couldn't find on um, LPs or, or any of it. So I thought, why, why is this version of the track Different. Well, uh, luckily I was I was in working in in Wave's uh, temp studio because Wave had just set up with Johnny Byrne and we were in there working and uh, Nick Morris, who was Jonathan's producer, I don't know what he was doing there, but he showed up and he said, "What are you guys doing here?" And uh, we said, oh, "We're looking, we're trying to get the music for this for this thing, yeah, for this film." And he said, "Oh, you have any?" And I said, "Yeah, I'm looking for this." sound that I found on a I found it on a film but I can't find it on the bands on anywhere in the band's uh, LP and he said oh, what's the film and I said oh, it's uh, Waves and uh, no connection at all to you know the fact that it was surfing it was just like a, it was just uh, and I said oh, could, is there any way you could just ask him about this you know like, and as he was going I said is there any way I could talk I said is, where is the guy based and he said oh he's on I said is there any way you could get him to give me a call or come in I'd love to talk to him you know so uh, anyway, this guy turned up, Peter Rayburn, and um, I gave him the brief. I said, I said to him, Look, what I'm looking for is the sound, you know, pure joy and pure terror in someone's head. I said, it's, it's someone I die in this moment, but it's also, it's the perfect moment in their life. So they sort of didn't care. And he came back with, he came back with a lot of good tracks, but within that was the left field track. And... The only reason he had that track left field, Bad Planet, hadn't been released. It was in the studio still. And the only reason he knew about it was because he was friends with one of the guys in the band. So it was that tenuous to get that track, you know. And um, when I heard it, I just went, you know, this is, this is, you know, perfect. There was a few discussions internally in the agency about, you know, some people weren't to totally sold on it. But I, I, my, my argument was very clear. I said I'd listened to... Uh, 2000 tracks and this is the best one if anybody could beat it you know i would love to hear it so we went down the path with that and um it worked out okay but uh peter rayburn incredible you know he just brought in he brought in like you know uh i would say maybe like 15 tracks that were all very very good you know but that was you know unquestionably the best fit you know and, and, and perfect for what we were trying to what we we're trying to get energy wise you know so yeah that was that was how that turned out um yeah music music always key always a, always a challenge so yeah. another lesson that i'm writing down here from yeah. talking to you is that nothing is by chance no, no. you it, you it takes listening to 2000 soundtracks to get to the one you want and that's yeah. why nobody could find a better one it takes going to Cornwall and thinking about surfing to go from an ad of a guy sitting in Polynesia to, to you know, to involve Nep Neptune and white horses in this whole thing. Yeah. I think that's the, yeah, I think that's the thing. It's like, it's going back to what you were saying, you know, there's an emotional sort of context to it. You know? And the more emotionally you get involved in the making, I think there is almost uh, an osmosis. You sort of, you carry something into each moment and that multiplies what you're doing and the, both things sort of add up to something more, you know, you know, just sort of the way you look after 
you know, your children and you give them, you know, the best. This element, you know, of this thing is part of nurturing this idea. It's feeding this idea to make it stronger, to make it more robust. What were or was the most the battles you had to win for this act? There, there were strange, there were strange little battles, you know, I mean, for example, about the age of the swimmer, you know, so that question came up quite a bit. So the first ad had this, like this older sort of guy, and I'd sort of describe him as a, as a sort of a muscular Picasso, you know, in the, in the script, you know. Well, how old do you mean, you know? And I said, well, you know, I said, he's, he's an older, I said, this is all his history, you know. So what age do you think he could be, you know? And they said, uh, well, he could be 35, you know? And I said, yeah. I said, so I said, but you know, I said, you know, there are these guys that are 35, but they sort of look 45, you know? So I was just then not really being serious about it, but just sort of saying, you know, let's just find the right guy, you know? And we find a guy, like the, the guys, I mean, I said, we find the, the guys who went out and did the casting, you know, I gave them a brief to say, you know, look at, uh, look at people who are ex- circus people, you know, people who are physically still really strong, you know, look at people who sort of maybe have been in competitive, you know, sort of doing, um, you know, triathlons, look at those people, look at people who live in the sea, you know, and, and so they find this guy and uh, we were actually sort of getting quite tight to the deadline of, of like, you know, having to shoot and we thought, we'd find like a couple of guys that were okay, but we didn't love them. And then this tape arrived, and it was this guy walking down there, almost exactly as I described him in the script. The scuba bottoms turned down. I described in the script, you know, this notion of him doing um, press-ups with someone on his back. And I'm looking at him thinking, yeah, he's about 60, you know, he maybe he's like 62. Wow, this guy's amazing. So we got him, there's a little bit of debate in the, in the, I just said, well, let's just show it to Andy. Let's just show it to Andy Fennell. You know the client Andy. You know looked at it in the in the in the meeting. And he just looked like I remember it was sort of on the screen. And he was just there. He looked at it anyway. Like after five seconds, he went, "He's great, isn't he?" You know, and it's that. It's just that energy, you know. And again, like even in the pre-production meeting, uh, you know, you talk about you know what makes it happen. In the pre-production meeting um, for Swim Black, uh, at the end of the meeting, Andy Fennell said, "Oh." Just one other thing, uh, is there any way I could have a longer cut for cinema? And, you know, you could just see Jonathan going, wow, you know? So, again, it's that thing, he's putting that energy into the process, you know, it's, it's ambition, and it's saying, you know, I, I, want, I want more of this. I don't, I don't want to suppress it, I want it to grow, you know? So that, that, um, that sort of stuff. And then there was a few little moments, you know, sort of in the, in the, in, in the, uh, in the process of surf, you know, where you have to sort of go, there was a, there was one very funny moment where um, in, the, in the process, you know, things evolve and there's different conversations. But on the previous one, we've done a 60 second cut and uh, an 80 second cut. You know, so on Swim Black, there was a 60 second and an 80 second cut. In, in, um, in this one, as we started to look at it and started to, you know, feel it, I thought, actually, a 90 second cut might be great here, you know. So there was a strange, <laughs> there was a strange moment when the 90 second thing became like a bit of an issue. Not with Andy. Andy had weirdly sort of gone uh, deeper into Diageo. So he bought the thing and then he went off. But sort of somewhere from Diageo, there came this question mark over the longer time length. And then um, we had a couple of discussions about it. But then I got this memo one day saying, you know, the 92nd version is no longer on the table. You know, we can't discuss it anymore, you know. So uh, I said that, that I said okay. So I just went into the edit suite and cut a 100 second version, which ran. You know? <laughs> so it's a it's a little bit like you know it's it's you know yeah you've got when you've got a little bit of that resi, re, residual energy, you can try and be a little bit more you know uh, set. I mean I I I I, I uh, I think 90, 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, Guinness were sort of absolutely sort of, they, lo they loved it, you know, and, uh, driven by Andy. He was particularly, you know, good with us. And then, you know, just a, just a t you know, it's a tiny hiccup, but it's also, it's, it's, it's funny because, you know, eventually it gets back to the 100 second thing and he goes, well, why is that on cinema? Yeah. So it's that sort of thing. You know? it's, 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 a, it's a kind of, um, 
you know, it's a kind of, again, it's that weird alignment, you know, who's got the right objectives in the right moment, and then you get a little bit of confidence, and then you can be a little bit more confident. Jose, when, when you pick this, and going back to what we've just talked about, the long cuts and all of the elements coming together, you said that it embodies all this epic um, about advertising, but that as an industry, we aren't doing as many of these anymore. Why do you think that is? And can we have more ads like this now? I think if I, I think we need to, and I, I I don't think that we're not doing as many. Uh, I, I, I do think we're doing very few of them now, but I don't think we ever did many of them. That's why this stands out. This was groundbreaking at its time, and if you ran it today, it would be groundbreaking all over again. I, I don't I don't like to look back at advertising through rose tinted glasses and think that before it was easier because it wasn't. It was as hard as it is today in many ways. Maybe we had we had more uh, more opportunities to do long format television, but now we have digital work that doesn't matter if it's 90, 90 seconds, 100 or 125. Don't do it as often as we should. Every time it happens, it has an enormous on society and on the brands and on the industry. It's, you tend to think when you look back at when you look back at the history of advertising, you tend to see more epic ads, but you don't know you don't know the timeline. It was groundbreaking the first time you saw it. What was the film I saw? I can only remember this ad. So yeah. it must it, and and we need to do more of it, and we've never done enough. Do you think then if this was to launch today, it would hold up in this year's Immortal Awards and walk away with a, a top award? I'd have no doubt about it. I would vote for it. Um, guys, thank you so much um, for, for joining me today, for doing our first Most Immortal Ad chat. I could sit and listen to you guys talk all day. I'm sure many more could too. Um, but we'll have to wrap it up near here. So um, thank you. So much for your time, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Kind words, amazing words. Let's let's have a cup of tea soon. And I think it's very fitting that this is the first immortal ad series that you do because this deserves to be the first one. I appreciate it so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I'll speak to you both soon. All the best. Good luck. Bye. He waits. That's what he does. And I'll tell you what, tick followed tock followed tick followed tock followed tick. Ahab says I don't care who you are, here's to your dream. The old sailors return to the bar. Here's to you Ahab! And the fat drummer hit the beat with all his heart. to waiting.